let's talk about this harrowing of hell. We don't talk about the harrowing of hell very much. Uh, let me start in, in, the, in the Swedenborgian churches, in the new church. <clears throat> this is the uh, Lutheran Book of Concord. And at the beginning, it has the three ecumenical creeds. Ecumenical means that they were universal to both Catholicism and later on Protestantism, and you know, widely accepted creeds. The first is the Apostolic uh, Creed, the second is the Nicene, and the third is the Athanasian. And the first and third both have this language in them. Um, this is sort of a basic statement of Christian belief. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into the heavens. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and, and so on. He descended to hell. Interesting, in between his death and burial and his rising, it says. And in the Athanasian Creed, toward the end, it says, he suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose from the dead, ascended into the heavens, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, the same sort of language that he descended into hell. It is uh, of interest to a, a Latin person like me that the phrase that's used here, if you'll forgive a little technical moment, is ad inferos. Now, if it had meant the hells, it would have said ad inferna, plural of the hells, but the inferos means to the lower people. The people is implied in the ending. To the, to, the lower, to the lower people. He descended, descended ad inferos. He descended to the lower people. And this is a Latin term that's used uh, of the inhabitants of the underworld. Uh, you know, since ancient times, the Latin has been used that way. So it's interesting that it's, it sounds the way we just read it, that he just plain descended into hell. But in the Latin, to my mind, it reads more that he descended to people not to the place of, of hell, but to these people, the lower, the lower people. Mm. Now, this concept, it's been called the harrowing of hell. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, harrowing, you know, is after you've plowed a field, you take a, a device with a bunch of tines in it that straightens it out, and that's called harrowing. And we also use that of ha harrowing experiences and so forth, you know, challenging or, or you know, horrific experiences. Uh, I don't know quite why it's called the harrowing of hell, but it picked up that title. It was a very popular concept, very prominent in Christianity in the Middle Ages, and a tr ton of medieval art is about this, about this descent into hell that Jesus did after he was resurrected. Um, but then Christianity seemed along the way, somewhat, I'm speaking in very broad terms, to sort of forget about this this concept, it, it ceased to make sense to people. And, and I, I think the reasoning goes something along this line that uh, wasn't he resurrected? Isn't everything in scripture about the fact that he was raised, you know? He didn't, like why, after all that, why would you go down? You know, what, what would the point be in going to hell, uh, you know, right after he, he died? And in an interesting way, uh, Swedenborgianism has an interesting take on this that I hope to, uh, it's not something we talk about much, but I think we, we could. There's something for us to see in here, I believe. Um, something for all Christians to see in this, because I think there's some truth to it. Let's start with Matthew chapter 27, if you would. Now see all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the New Testament, have accounts of Jesus' crucifixion. There are some things that the Gospels have in common, some things that only one Gospel has, and so forth. But the story, the whole thing, the Last Supper, uh, Jesus' betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, his arrest, and so forth, there are little details that differ between the Gospels. But they all have the same story. But Matthew has two verses that nobody else touches with a 10-foot pole. You know, this is the only place in the New Testament you hear this. And it's Matthew chapter 27, 
verses 52 and 53. Let's just read a few verses before to see where we are in context. Let's pick up at verse 50 in Matthew 27. So Jesus has been on the cross for some time. Go ahead. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was bore, torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. Oh, what graves? What are you talking about? The graves were open? Okay. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Oh, what is that about? The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep arose. Okay. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Hmm. And then uh, let's read on a little bit there because it's important for the context. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. All right, let's, let's stop there. Now, they saw the earthquake it said, and the things that were done, they make no mention of this rather stunning moment where these graves open and these saints are seen. But not explicitly. I mean, it might be implied by the fact that it says they saw those things that were done, but it doesn't, you'd think they'd be saying, what was that? You know, uh, but they don't seem to comment on it. It's just two little verses that are just stuck in the story. They don't occur in Mark. They don't occur in Luke. They don't occur in John. Hmm, strange. So right after Jesus died, there's this idea that the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep arose and came out of their grave. Isn't that weird? They came out of their graves? Like, from a new church belief, and I think this accords with what we sort of instinctively think, uh, many people instinctively think, is that, you know, when you die, your, your spirit goes into the spiritual world and it's not like you you wake back up out of the grave i mean i know there's been those ideas with the last judgment and everything but isn't that weird the graves were open and these many bodies of the saints came up and they they came out of their graves after his resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared to many very mysterious but i think this has something to do with the harrowing of hell as i hope to demonstrate uh, this evening. Okay, um, now let's let's just thicken the plot, shall we? Let's turn to the Old Testament and uh, see if you can find the book of Ezekiel back there. If you find the Psalms or Isaiah, head to the right. You go through Jeremiah, Lamentations, then you get to Ezekiel. And we're looking for chapter 37. See that mention in Matthew is, I believe, one of only two mentions in all of the Old and New Testament where graves are opened. So graves were opened. So it reminded me of another passage where graves are opened. Let's have a look at this. Ezekiel 37, and we'll pick up at the first verse, and it's going to be fun and interesting. All right. <clears throat> the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Ooh. Hmm. Familiar story. Go on. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. Hmm. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh, Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones. Now, wait a minute. I, I don't think prophesying to bones is going to do much good, personally. You know? I think the ears are gone by now. I, I don't think it's going to do much good. But that's, that's the advice. Prophesy to the bones. Okay, prophesy to the bones. Um, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Okay, now fix that statement in your mind. You're supposed to prophesy to these dry bones and say, Bones, hear the word of the Lord. Bizarre. This is a bizarre story. Is it bizarre so far? I think it's bizarre, right? Okay, let's keep going. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, mm. 
Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sin now, in you. Now, this is also just, I just want you to notice a little thing about Scripture. I don't know what it means, but listen to what is the first thing the Lord said. He said he was going to cause breath to enter in. That's what he said first. I'll cause breath to enter into you. That's what he said, right? I'll cause breath to enter into you first. And then what does he say? And you'll live. And then what? Go on. I will put sinews on you okay. and bring flesh upon you. Oh. Cover you with skin and put breath in you. Oh, now what, there was already breath in there. And so you typical of scripture, you know? Like this is why people think, oh, well, it's poorly written. An editor would have cut out one of the two of those. You know, why do you say cause breath to enter you? Then I'll put sinews, then flesh, and then skin, and then I'll put breath in you. Why does it say that? Hmm, we never find out. So let's just be mystified. Go on. <laughs> And you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Ah, and that is a refrain, as you may have heard me say before, I counted in Ezekiel how many times that something like that phrase comes up. I counted 60 times in this one book that the result of all this is that you know that he's the Lord. Go on. So what does Ezekiel do? So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Now this is one of the funnest passages in Scripture, isn't it? There's a noise. And so, so he's prophesying. Now, at, at that point, I just imagine, you know, I'm just reading myself into the story, but I imagine Ezekiel feels a certain sense of futility. Prophesying to bones. Don't you think? <laughs> he's in the valley, and these very whitened, dry, very, very dry, you know, they're not just recent bones, very, very dry. And he's standing out there proclaiming the word of the Lord. <laughs> it's got to feel a little pointless, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Go on. Uh, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, mm. and suddenly a rattling, Ooh. and the bones came together, bone to bone. Wow. I think Ezekiel's probably surprised at this point. <laughs> Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Now, wait a minute. You just, the Lord just said, I'm going to put my breath in them. Then I'll put them together, get the sinews, get the flesh, get the skin, and then I'll put breath in. And then we hear about the sinews and the flesh and the skin, but there's no breath. Isn't that curious? It's just one of those little, I don't know what it means, but it's fascinating. Go on. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live yeah it's important that they're slain like these people who were out there who died in the valley uh they didn't just die of natural causes they were slain it says right these were people who were slain and they're out in the in the valley and that the the these the four winds it says in the old king james or these breaths will come together and breathe upon these slain that they may live go on so i prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them mm. and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army now i don't imagine i think this is probably a story to be taken literally i don't imagine there's any inner meaning to that <laughs> do you probably happened just literally the way it's described uh, go on what does it say next <laughs> then he said to me son of man these bones are the whole house of Israel. Oh, it's metaphorical. Oh, I misread it. It says the bones are the house of Israel. Interesting. Oh, the bones are the house of Israel. So there's something about the house of Israel that was dead in the valley there. And prophesying needs to take place. And then these bones will rattle and they come together. And they turn back into a human being and they get this breath and they come back to life. And go on. Mm. Um, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Mm. Yeah. So it's metaphorical, as it turns out. These are people who are alive and well, like you and me, who are saying our bones are dried. They're not talking about their physical bones. They're, they're alive. They can speak. But they're saying that their bones are dried and their hope is lost. Mm. The bones are dried and their hope is lost. Mm. Something about the heart or the flesh or something that they lost was like their hope. Their hope is lost and they're cut off. Okay, go on. 
Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, mm. Behold, O my people, I will open your graves. There it is. Only other mention that I know of in Scripture. I may be wrong. It, it, there's a first time for everything. But, but uh, I think this is <laughs> only the... Um, <laughs> go on. <laughs> I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Yes, I will open your grave. Oh, my people. Oh, my people, says the Lord. I will open your grave. Same language as right after the Lord died. Open the graves. Hmm, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves. And where will they go? Bring you into the land of Israel. Yes, that's right. Up out of your graves and I'll bring you into the land of Israel. That's very significant. Now these are these are the people, these are the house of Israel, right? But he's going to bring them into the land of Israel, to bring them into the holy land. Mm. And what will be the result of that, may I ask? Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. Mm. I will put my spirit in you. Oh, you mean your spirit is like that breath. Your spirit is that life, is that what it is? You'll put your spirit in us okay I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land mm, listen to that can you hear that mm. then you shall know that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it says the Lord thank you that is the story of the dry bones mm, isn't that an interesting story and I think that relates I want to look back in Matthew 27 again to see what exactly that says Matthew 27, verse 52, in there. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints. See, in Ezekiel, it's the house of Israel, right? Hmm, it's the house of Israel that's lost its hope. And this is many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep. In that earlier one, it said that our bones are dried and we've lost our hope, right? Mm. And they'd fallen asleep and they arose and came out of their graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city. Oh, isn't that like they went into the holy land? The holy city, the holy land, come into the land, I'll take you into the land, right? Isn't this the same? Seems like the same story, or certainly, certainly parallel. They go into the holy city and they appeared to many. And yet the centurion doesn't seem to notice or mention it specifically. I mean, I think if I'd been like all that stuff is astounding, but I actually think that people getting up out of the graves and walking around would probably be the most attention getting thing that happened there. You know, and I'd probably say something about that. But the centurion. Yeah, you see, here's a little clue. <coughs> Which city? It didn't say, did it? It just the said holy the, the holy city. It didn't say Jerusalem. It said the holy city. Hmm. And in Ezekiel, it's obviously being metaphorical. Dry bones. They're going to wake up. They're going to get flesh and life, which is my spirit, says the Lord. And then I'll bring you into the holy land. Maybe that's not a physical city that it's talking about there. Which would help me very much in the interpretation of this passage. Because otherwise I don't know what to do with it. But if it's in the world of spirits, if it's something spiritual, that there's something spiritual about these graves being opened, you see the body, often in scripture, as you know, that sleeping is used of, of physical death. People have fallen asleep and so forth. It, it'll, it'll say that, you know? Even in the Lazarus story, it doesn't say something about he's sleeping and so on. And, and um, uh, the sleeping has to do with physical death. So these are the bodies of the saints which had fallen asleep. They arose. And yet 1 Corinthians 15 says that we have a natural body and we have a spiritual body. And the natural body is sown in corruption. Like it just decays in the grave. There's this spiritual body. I don't think these were their physical bodies. These graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep arose and came out of their graves after his resurrection. And went into the holy city and appeared to many. I think that was a spiritual event. And that might be why it's not recorded in any of the other Gospels. And why the centurion didn't even comment on it. As far as I can tell. 
because I think he was seeing the physical scene, the earthquake, the rocks split. That was plenty for him to comment on. He didn't even see this event. It's just recorded in Matthew that this is a spiritual event. That's just my theory. Okay, okay, okay. Mm. All right. Let's turn to the right. We're going to go to the epistles of the Apostle Peter. So you go to the right through a whole bunch of things. You get through Hebrews, and you get to James, and you get to First and Second Peter. And I want to look at First Peter. Chapter 3, we'll read a bit of this. Let's pick up at verse 10, if you would. Um, and let's just, you know, I, I deliberately picked a fairly long reading here so we can get, get our orientation. But Peter, so this is well after the resurrection, and Peter's talking to, uh, to, uh, to the disciples and so forth. Go on. For he who would love life, and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Oh, that's so faith alone, isn't it? No, what's going on? He says you have to refrain your tongue from evil. It seems to me like the Ten Commandments are still in effect there after the Lord's resurrection, that you have to stop speaking evil and deceit and so forth. So forth. Go on. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Isn't there something about that in the Psalms? Seek peace and pursue it. I always find that. I just want to hit pause for a second and just say, I, isn't it wonderful? You think of peace as being still in the present moment or something like that. And yet to pursue peace, it must be somewhere else and you're chasing it, which is not a peaceful activity. But that's what we're told to do. It's kind of fascinating, isn't it? Mm. Seek peace and pursue it. Go on. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, mm. and his ears are open to their prayers. Mm. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Mm. Seems like it's sort of preaching the same thing as the Ten Commandments that haven't been done away with. Go ahead. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Hmm. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be re ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear the what that is in you the hope oh what were those Ezekiel saw those dry bones and they said we have no hope but these followers of the Lord they have hope be ready to tell anybody the reason you have hope why do you have hope go on having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers those who revile your good those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed I love this verse go on for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil <laughs> isn't that great <laughs> you know suffering is unfortunately on the menu friends uh, but here's a little tip Better to suffer for doing what is good than doing what is evil, because you're going to get the suffering either way, but the, this is better. I like that. It's good teaching. And what's the example of that? Read on. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Ooh. Like those bones, right? The spirit is what brings him. To, so that's what resurrected Jesus. He died in the flesh, but the spirit raised him up. Go on. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. He did what? Went and what did you say? He went and preached to the spirits in prison. He did? Spirits. After he died, he went and in preached the to the spirits in prison? Wow, what prison was that? Spirits, it says. Spirits? The spirits. See, the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints were seen. He went and preached to the spirits, hmm, in prison. Go on. Who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. Noah? Well, that goes back, you know, <coughs> I mean, if you know your Bible, Noah's a while ago, you know, you, you've got the whole... 
thing with Moses and the Ten Commandments it came since then, uh, wandering in the wilderness and everything, whole thing, getting in the Holy Land, being kicked out of the Holy Land, prophecies that you come back. All of that is, you know, Noah's way at the, what is it, Genesis chapter 8 and 9, and, you know, it's way, way back there. Since Noah, go on. Well, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Saved through water. Hmm, saved through water. Okay, saved through water. And what did Ezekiel have to do to those dry bones? How did he get all that magic to happen? He prophesied the word of the Lord to them, right? Saved by water. There's some relationship between the water and the prophesying that word of the Lord. Okay, go on. Hmm. Uh, doodly doodly doodly. Yes. There's <laughs> precisely. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. Oh, listen to that. It's not about physical washing with physical water mm. to put away the filth of the flesh. But the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Oh, okay, so those creeds said he, he died, he descended into hell, and he, oh, so I guess what he was doing when he went down was he preached under the spirits in prison. Interesting language. Go ahead. Uh, at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Hmm, yeah, okay. So there's some idea that he went after he died, put to death in the flesh, quickened by the Spirit, went and preached to the spirits in prison. Yes, okay. And when we started out this reading, it was talking about not doing evil and seeking peace and doing good. And if you're going to suffer anyway, why not suffer for doing well instead of for doing evil and so forth. Now let's look at the, just the first few verses of chapter 4, just 1 through 6 here. Because this is, uh, again... It's not just like, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. It sounds like there's something we have to do. Go on. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh. All right, that's what we're talking about, right? Arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Hmm. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Don't you love that phrase? That's a ringing phrase to me. Even if you did it in the past, we don't have to any longer live the rest of our time in the flesh for the lusts of men. You know, we don't have to serve that, not for the rest of our lives. We can get out of that. We can do the will of God instead. Go on. I love this language here. Go ahead. Okay. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime. Wouldn't in, you not agree, friends? In doing the will of the Gentiles. Yes. When we walked in lewdness, Did we? lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. No, not us. <laughs> in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. <laughs> they yeah, they'd rather you stay with the dissipation program. That's right. <laughs> They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. Oh, what was that? The gospel was, pre was preached also to those who are dead. Is that the same as the people in the spirits in the prison? Just above it, use the same word preached, right? Probably. He went and preached to the spirits in prison, and right down here, the gospel was preached to them that are dead. Hmm. Hmm. And for what purpose? That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, <clears throat> but live according to God in the Spirit. Oh, that's some profound teaching there. And it's very, very clear that the way we live our lives matters. Is it not? You know? Isn't it time that we gave up? You know, don't, haven't we spent enough time following the will of the Gentiles? Isn't it about time we started following the will of God and getting away from walking? It says walking. It's not, it doesn't mention anywhere about belief. It says you have to walk, get away from walking in lust and reveling and drinking parties and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, even if you have to break off, you know, relationships with people who are still in that dissipation or whatever it is. 
you know, uh, or, or get away from that behavior. For this cause was the gospel preached to those that are dead, the bodies of many of the saints who had fallen asleep came up out of their graves. Hmm. They went into the holy city and were seen by many right after the Lord died. He gave up the ghost in verse 50 and just a couple of verses later. That's what you're hearing about. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And let's turn to the left now to Hebrews. I just want to read a couple of verses of what we read last time. This is what got me started about thinking about this topic for this week, that it mentions all these people in the Old Testament who did all these faithful things. It talks about Abraham and Rahab and Gideon and, you know, all these people. And what does it say in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, my good friend? What does it say there? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So all these people have been talking about before, Abraham and Sarah and Noah and so forth. Mm -hmm. Noah shows up again in there. They died in faith, not having received the promises. They didn't get the promise. Mm -hmm. They did everything right, but they didn't get the prize yet. But they saw them afar off that one day they would get the prize. And what does it say in verse 39 of that same chapter there? And all because these... it goes into a whole list of people, all the prophets, what they all went through, and everybody, Joseph, everybody in the Old Testament just about. And what does it say in verse 39? And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Oh, and what does it say at the end there? God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Wow. So we read a little minute ago, did we not, that even all the way back to the time of Noah, mm, even back to the time of Noah, something about this harrowing applies. And here are people who did everything, lived faithfully, but did not receive the promise. And yet after the Lord died, these graves open up like the dry bones, just like the dry bones preach the word of the Lord to them and the bones reassemble and they get flesh on them and they come back to life. Mm, what is going on here? You can see why people got this idea that there was something about Jesus going down. He descended. All right. Um, it's time for me to draw some parallel lines. It's been several minutes since I drew some parallel lines, uh, let's just keep it simple this time and we'll just simply talk about heaven up here and we'll talk about the world of spirits where we all go after we die and where our minds are now. And then down below there is hell, or the hells in plural, and then we're taught that there's this place called the lower earth, Sorry if you can't see that back there. A place that's sort of of the world of spirits, but it's really below it, that dips down into hell. This is Swedenborg's description, very simply put, of the world of spirits. The world of spirits is where we go after we die, says Swedenborg, and there we are processed. We're sort of reduced to our least essence by a variety of experiences. We go down around to different societies, see what we love, what we don't love, and so forth. And we go through some difficult experiences sometimes. People who are ready for heaven, and some are ready immediately at the hour of death, go up. Boom. They're, they're easily processed. They're ready to go. They've got everything they need. They got it while they were here in this world. People who are absolutely set on hell sometimes go to hell in the hour of their death, says Swedenborg. Some of them are seen diving down head first. They're just, they've made their choice. Boom. There's no processing required. But a lot of people go to the world of spirits, and there's this area called the lower earth. Hmm. The lower earth, and uh, I believe this lower earth has something to do with the graves, the graves that were opened. There were people down here ever since the time of Noah, as far as we can tell from Scripture. People had been accumulating down here. Now, why were they not processed? Why were they not 
in heaven yet. They've, they've been down there for a couple thousand years. You know what? And they're not in hell, but they're not in heaven. They're not in the world of spirits. They're down here in the lower earth. What's going on? What is it like in that pit? All right. Uh, I just want to show you a few things. Uh, let's go back to Jeremiah. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's right after Isaiah. It's to the right of Isaiah. We'll go to Jeremiah chapter 4. These are just little tidbits. You see, it said that those bones were slain. They weren't just people who died of themselves. They were slain. The bones of the people who were slain were lying in the valley there. And the children of Israel said, that's us. That's me. Our bones are dried. We don't have hope anymore. You know? Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 31, good friend. I think this is a description of that state. It's subtle, but I think it's a description of the state of these people who are in the lower earth. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor, mm. the anguish as of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. She spreads her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. Oh, they were slain. She's, she's been slain, right? Her soul is, now she's not killed, her spirit is not killed. She's still alive, but her soul is weary because of these murderers, the slain. Who are these, who are these murderers? What's going on? They're right next to hell here, and they're influenced by hell, but they're not in it. And this cry of travail, anguish, like bringing forth their first child, and it says the voice of the daughter of Zion. These are the same people, aren't they? The dry bones, right? The house of Israel, it says. Mm. Okay, so that seemed relevant. And let's try, uh, to me at least, let's try um, uh, Psalm 63. So turn to the left. You get to the Psalms there pretty soon. Go to Psalm 63. Oh! All right, let's read the whole Psalm. Shall we, just for fun? I think this too is about this area down here and the state of being in this lower earth. Picture that valley again. Go on. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land when there is no water. It said those bones were so dry. Our bones are dried. They're dried. A thirsty place where there's no water. They're down in the pit here, I think. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. And where's the sanctuary? It's sort of up from there, right? The lower earth has an opening at the top. You can see up to heaven from there. I looked for you in your sanctuary. I couldn't get there, but I could look in that direction. Go on. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Now you notice that's all in the future tense. Will be satisfied. My mouth will praise you in the future. Go on. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Mm. Because you have been my help, Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, <coughs> I will rejoice. Mm. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Mm. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. Oh, they'll go where? Into the lower <coughs> parts of the earth. Oh, very interesting. The lower parts of the earth. Okay. They shall fall by the sword. Oh, They'll be slain. They shall be a portion for jackals. Mm. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak, the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Ah, I think those lies are lies that are breathing in from hell onto that area of the lower earth. There are lies coming through the walls of that pit. But those lies shall be stopped and they'll be lifted up at some point. 
Um, and one more like this. Uh, let's look at Psalm 79. We've got lots more scriptures, but just one more about what I think is the state in the pit. Uh, oh, let's just... Um, see, he went to print, print, preach to who? Who did he preach to? The bones. Uh, prison. The, the prisoners, right. Yeah, it said to the, the, those, in, the spirits in prison, right? Mm -hmm. uh, look at Psalm 79, picking up at verse 11. Let the groaning of the prisoner come before you. Mm. According to the greatness of your power, preserve those who are appointed to die. Mm. And return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach with which they have reproached you, O Lord. So we, your people and the sheep of your pastor, will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. Yeah, I thought that sighing of the prisoner was powerful. But good things are going to happen in, in the future. We will give you thanks forever. In, in the future, we will give you thanks forever. Turn to the right, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 24. Just trying to hunt for these people in the pit and trying to figure out what's going on with this harrowing of hell. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 22... Okay, let's pick up at verse 21. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. Oh, listen to that. Isn't that interesting? Gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. So that unites both the pit, the idea of the lower parts of the earth, the fact that they're prisoners. Go on. And will be shut up in the prison. After many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Hmm, his elders. I wonder if those are the people who've been around ever since the time of Noah. I don't know for sure. <laughs> Let's turn to the... Uh, oh. Oh, let's turn back to Psalm 130, if you would, my dear and indulgent friends. Uh, it's very late in the Psalms there, so if you go back through Isaiah, you'll get to Psalm 130. We'll read that whole Psalm, if you would. A Song of Ascents. Oh, a Song of Ascents. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Oh, what would those depths be? Hmm, out oh. of the depths I have cried to you. Okay. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Hmm. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I do hope. Oh, there's hope. And what are you hoping in? The Lord. In the Word, right? In His, in his word, word, I do hope. I hope. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His Word do I hope. And this is very poignant, the next verse there. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. The morning is when the Lord comes into the world, when He dawns. That's what Easter morning means, right? I wait for the Lord more than those who wait for the morning. I think there are people down here who have been waiting a long time for the Lord to dawn, and that morning is going to come. Let's see what those last two verses say. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Mm. All right, that's good. Let's read one more like this. Can you turn to the right and find Zechariah? Can be a challenge. You've got to go through Ezekiel and Daniel and all that. And you almost get to the New Testament. You've got Zechariah, Malachi, and then Matthew. So if you get to Matthew, you've gone too far. Zechariah chapter 9. Hmm. And we'll just read verse 11. Mm. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Oh, 
There are some interesting juxtapositions, aren't they? The blood of the covenant. Well, what is that blood of the covenant? What did Ezekiel have to do to the bones? He had to prophesy and bring the word, right? It has to do with the word. And we tell, heard about Noah being saved by the water, which is really the, the truth, the word. And here it says, there's a waterless pit, but by the blood of the covenant, I've sent forth your prisoners. Hmm. Divine truth. We learned a few weeks ago that blood is divine truth. The blood of the covenant. Hmm. All right. Um, okay. Let's do... Uh, let's turn back to Isaiah. We've just got a few more of these, friends. Isaiah to the left, chapter 61, verse 1. Very familiar phrase to you, I'm sure. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Ooh, who are these captives? He's going to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Mm. And let's look in the New Testament. In Luke, if you would, you know where I'm going with this. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Could be titled, When Jesus Goes Home Again. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Mm. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, mm. to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's right. That's right. He got a lot of, in a lot of trouble for saying that. Mm. Yep. Preach deliverance to the captives. This is what he says about his ministry. That's what he's doing. Deliverance to the captives. Mm. Um, okay, I want to shift forward. I am planning on pulling this together, friends. I hope it'll work. Let's turn to Revelation in the, in the very end of the New Testament because all that we just read, I believe, was about the time when Jesus was in the world. He came into the world, he died, and then there was some kind of descent where he went down and freed these captives. The bound, the dry bones, you know, breathed life back into them, brought them up into the Holy Land. Just like those graves that were opened and they went into the Holy City. I think those are the same stories. I think there is in the new church a harrowing of hell that, that the Lord did. And that was part of his purpose. Now, in the book of Revelation, you have a prophecy from after the Lord was resurrected about what would happen many years in the future. Um, and the first thing I want to read here is uh, in chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, we'll skip some of this here, but there's a book. There's a book, and no one, it's sealed with seven seals, and no one can open it. And John is weeping in verse 4, because no one's worthy to open the book. And read verse 5 if you would. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Yes, the only one in heaven and earth who's able to open that book, the scroll with the seven seals, is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's, that's Jesus, that's resurrected Jesus. He has the power to open that book. I want to refer to this a little later if all goes according to my devious plan. In Revelation chapter 6, look at verses 9 to 11 if you would. This is about some future time. 
Mm. And when John he, saw this in the spiritual world. Mm. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. Where, where was it? Under the altar. Oh, under the altar. Okay, what's under the altar? It's a the, weird place to be, isn't it? Under the altar. The souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for oh, the testimony they which they held. They were slain for the word of God and for the testimony. So these are the slain. Aren't, aren't these similar to the house of Israel who were slain? Mm -hmm. Oh, the soul under the altar. And they're under the altar. They're under the altar. Souls of those who were slain. What was it like for them? And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Hmm. Then a and, white Yes, go ahead. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Okay, so they need to wait a little longer. Again, this picture of patience, waiting under the altar, but they're given these white robes, and they're told to wait a little longer. Okay, and turn to chapter 7. Pick up at verse 13, if you would, because we hear about them again here. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? Mm. And where did they come from? Good question. And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Mm. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. In the future. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more, the sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. Oh, it's like Psalm 23, isn't it? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Okay, they may be crying now, but there's going to be a time when the Lord wipes away their tears. And they come out of great tribulation. Because they've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Didn't we see that the blood of the covenant had something to do with setting the prisoners free? It said the blood of the covenant had something to do with that. And one more. Mm -hmm. Chapter 20. And when I say one, I mean three, of course. Uh, chapter 20, uh, verses 4 and 5. Now, this is a little obscure, but here we go. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and oh. for the word of God. Oh, are these the slain? Are these the same that they were slain for their testimony and so forth? We just read about them, right? The same people. Who had not worshipped the beast or oh. his image. Oh. And had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Thank you. Okay. So again, there's a sense of these souls that are beheaded. And what they did was they did not worship the beast. They didn't buy into the, the, the thing that was wrong or bad or something. But they were still beheaded. And they're down there. And then there's some second group that didn't live until this thousand years were finished. There are two groups, and one's there now. And didn't we read that in that earlier statement uh, that the, the people who, in Hebrews 11, they didn't get their promise because it's going to wait until everybody gets their promise together. It's going to happen at the same time. They've been waiting down there. And uh, turn to the left. See if you can find Ephesians. You'd go to the left through Hebrews and and a lot of things with a T, and you'll go through Philippians, you'll get to Ephesians. Chapter 4. After What's that? After it's after, after Acts. Acts, that's right. It's after Acts and Romans and Corinthians and Galatians. And it's before Philippians and Colossians and so on. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, my good and patient friends. But to each one of us, 
Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Oh, that's an interesting phrase. He led captivity captive. Hmm. Hmm. And gave gifts to men. Oh. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? Smoking gun passage. <laughs> Is it not? He descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Right? He ascended, but he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Go ahead. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Okay, good. So now we have a whole jumble of passages loaded into our minds, and everything will become amazingly clear. Um, what I believe is going on here is this. Hmm. You see, the lower earth... You see, there were two, uh, I, uh, let, let me try to get at this maybe with a story. Let's say that there is some town far away from here in some failed state and warlords and terrorists uh, take over the town. But there are a number of people who are living in the town who have nothing to do with the warlords and everything like that. But the warlords are dominating that town. And people find out that there are uh, adults in the town who are not part of the warlords, but they're armed. And there are also a number of children in the town. And so what the forces of good do is they say, well, we've got to do something about this situation. Uh, first of all, let's go around and gather up all the adults who have weapons and get them to work with us because they know where the people are and we'll get them to work with us to fight. But we've got to leave the children where they are because they'll just get clobbered if, if the warlords have their way. So let's leave them where they are. Once we and the adults have conquered the warlords absolutely thoroughly, not one by one by one by one, but all of them are entirely conquered, then we can safely bring the children out. That's the story that we're talking about here. There are two different types of people who are involved in this. And it all has to do with truth. You see, geography, as you may have heard me say before, in the spiritual world is the same as our state of mind here in this world. And the lower earth is a place where you love the Lord. You look up to the sanctuary. We heard about that, right? But you are thinking false thoughts. In fact you are slain by falsities. Like you're hamstrung them by, you know, you have belief, like one example would be the belief that the Ten Commandments are done away with and there's no reason to follow your religion. That's a more recent idea. But that would hamstring you, wouldn't it? I mean, that idea certainly could make you feel like, well, I just have to have faith in Jesus. I won't go through repentance. I don't have to amend my life or anything like that. Well, you'll, you'll be stuck. You, you love the Lord, you wanna live a good life, but you're thinking the belief is holding you bound and you can't move forward in your life because what you're thinking is not right and not true. That's the state down in the lower earth. There are, I believe, some people, uh, so let's say, okay, before the Lord came into the world, you had people from ancient times and you, Noah was very early on, you had Abraham, you had all those other people that talked about in the Old Testament. A lot of them were very good people. They were, they were living faithful lives. There's a lot of evidence in the Old Testament that there was a belief in multiple gods and Jehovah was just the strongest one or he was the one who liked the children of Israel or whatever. But that's, not, that's not a true idea. But if you have that idea, you may be stuck in the pit. It may, you, know, you may not be able to get forward. Everything about you is good, but you've just got some idea that's stuck in your head that doesn't allow you to move forward. And so when you go to the spiritual world, you don't have enough truth to be in heaven. And so you go to the lower earth and you're bound there. You're imprisoned by ideas that you have. And it's not negative. It's not that somebody else sentences, sentences you to it. It's just that that's where you go when you're in that state of mind. That is the state of mind. That's where you go. 
And so you stay in that state of mind. Now, there are some people who are represented by the adults in my little story who have the weapons of truth. They, they understand enough that they're able to fight and they're not gonna be hurt by the warlords because they know how to defend themselves. But there are others who are like children and who cannot defend themselves. And the Lord sees that these children need to be protected. And what are they under? They're under the altar, right? Uh, this is the best altar I can draw right now. I apologize. Um, but let's just say they're under the altar. And the altar is the worship of God. There's some kind of good thing that protects them down here in this area. But they're not yet in a position. But they're, they're under the altar and they're held there. They're not yet in a position to rise up to heaven. They're waiting. They went through all their lives and they had faith, but the promises were not fulfilled for them yet because they're still down here. And my sense is that these people were here for a long time. We heard those senses of them crying out in the pit and so forth. It's not an altogether happy experience, but they're waiting for the Lord. They're waiting for the morning. My soul waits for the Lord. Like those who watch for the morning, who wait and watch for the morning. They know that the Lord is going to come someday and he's going to have the strength to deal with it. Now an interesting question about this is we learned a few weeks ago that the Lord conquered the worst evil spirits in hell when he was about 13, 14 years old. If he had that strength when he was 13 or 14, why could he not free the, the prisoners until after he died? That's weird. Isn't that weird? But the answer that came to me today when I was praying on this is that the Lord's life was about, there were three aspects of redemption, and then there was also his glorification. The three aspects of the redemption were re gaining control of the hells, restructuring the heavens, and creating a new church on earth, and then the other piece was his glorification. So redemption and glorification, and redemption has those three pieces to it. So, um, while he was here on earth, the Lord was taking advantage of his frailty. Some of you remember a Bible study I did a while ago called Divinity Bound. He himself was bound so that he could be down here on this level of hell. And it was like he was dealing with this warlord, this warlord, this warlord, this warlord while he's here. And he's gaining control of different pockets. But the whole thing is not contained until the point of his physical death in this world. You, said, you, you see, it says in John that the Holy Spirit did not it exist yet, did not exist yet because Jesus would not yet glorify. So he did not have that spirit of truth radiating out in the same way until after he was resurrected. At the time that he was resurrected, the image that I got was that his sphere, his Holy Spirit, filled this world, just filled it and kept hell at bay. Now he had control of everything related to hell. And it's, it wasn't just one at a time. It wasn't this Goliath and that Philistine and this problem. It, it was, he had control of the whole thing. He's got hell completely controlled. Then he can say, it's all right for the children to come out now. Because these are people who were vulnerable to the attack of hell. There are lots of us who are vulnerable to the attack of hell. And the Lord could see who would cave if they were assaulted. That's what I mean by my analogy, that there are children who could not stand up to a warlord. You know, what are they going to do? You know, they're going to get clobbered. They're going to get killed. There are adults who are armed and who have a fighting chance. They would go through, they would get processed, they would go to heaven because they have a fighting chance. But these people don't have a fighting chance. It's not a sentence down here, it's a protection. They're under the altar. They're protected by this worship of the Lord, by the goodness in their lives, and they're looking to the sanctuary and they're hoping. They're waiting for the Lord like those who wait for the morning to come. Then when the Lord comes into the world, when he leaves this world, he's completely conquered hell and his sphere fills all this and now it's safe. That's why he goes down. And he's going down to the lower people. He didn't go all the way down to the hells. The hells are already processed. And he dealt with them when he was in this world. Because you have to be down on that level to be able to interact with hell that closely. 
Once he was resurrected, he was a little beyond that point, you know? And these are people who have just made up their minds. At the end of Revelation, it says, let those who are filthy be filthy still. Those who are holy be holy still. They're, they're done. They're processed. These people are done. They're processed. These people are not done. They were vulnerable. They were vulnerable, and they'd been there a long, long time. And I don't know all the answers to this mystery, but there was something about the power of the Lord. You see, what did it say in Revelation 5? No one else could open that book. And Swedenborg says the meaning of that, the scroll with the seven seals, is that no one but the Lord knows all the states of the human mind. And I look in myself and I see the truth of this. I have a confession to make. I don't have the foggiest idea what goes on in here. Yeah, I don't know how to judge myself. Am I primarily this? Am I primarily that? Is this more important? Is that lesser? Is this my heart? And those are just like arteries and things that come out of the heart. I don't know. I just observe myself from day to day and sometimes I'm a complete idiot and sometimes I say something good and I don't know. I don't know what's on top and, and who's on first, you know. I don't know what's going on in there. I can't judge my own state. I certainly couldn't judge anybody else. Thank God we don't. Well, I think they're pretty. Well, I don't think so. They seem kind of cold and unfriendly. Oh, no, I thought they were, you know, we have no idea who each other are. These are people you're married to. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Only the Lord can judge the states of the human race. Only the Lord knows who's down here and what's they're made of. Isn't it a beautiful thing? The Lord doesn't say, oh, well, you're strong, so you're coming with me to heaven. The weak, I'm sorry, what can I do? <laughs> no, that's not his policy. Oh, you're weak? I will protect you. I've got a place for you. I'm going to keep you safe here from the onslaught of hell. Hell is getting louder and bigger that whole time leading up to his coming into the world. It's getting enormously powerful. Total damnation, as we talked about at Christmas time or whenever, it stood threatening at the door. He knows the power of hell and he knows the vulnerability of these people. And he keeps them safe down here. They're, 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 you know, it's not pleasant all the time. They're crying out. But it's a lot better than the alternative. And the Lord keeps his hand on them, keeps them safe, you know, until such time as he has the power to fill this world. He's been through his glorification now. He's got hell straightened out. Now he can fill that world with his presence, like an umbrella, like a sheet, like a force field. Say, all right, safe now. You can come out. He descended to the lower people, the people who were down here, and he released them. There was a harrowing, not of the hell, but of the lower parts of the earth, as Scripture calls it or the souls under the altar. And that happened when he came into the world the first time. And at the end of Christianity, Swedenborg describes a similar situation because that same situation happened again. You get people go there who are not fully processed yet and they're vulnerable. Hell rises up. They're kept safe there. It's a system of safety. So when I first started thinking about this harrowing of hell. It just seems so bizarre and medieval. Like, what is that? And why would he go down to hell and all that kind of stuff? But in a way, that is at least a big part of why he came into the world. To set the captives free. That's what he said. He stood up in Nazareth. He said, I'm here to proclaim and set the captives free. <clears throat> Only the Lord could do it. No one else could do it. But he kept them there. And they weren't happy every minute, but he kept them safe and was able to release them. And it's the first thing he did. Did he waste any time? Hang around. Hey, you've been there a couple of thousand years. What's another year, give or take? No, straight down. It's been a, the second the warlords are taken care of. Get the kids out. That's been the goal from the beginning. The goal is to get them out. Set them free and strengthen them. Yes? I wonder, it, it, does the Lord illumine their minds to correct the fault, the faulty ideas they had in order to lift them out, or do they mm. continue their faulty ideas? Excellent question. Does the Lord correct and enlighten their ideas, or what happens? I believe that's exactly what happens. He comes, he's the embodiment of divine truth, divine love, 
and he comes down into this area and, and through his sheer presence, I think they're, they're instructed and taught. And the only way to be released from there is to get a different thought. And we read a little, few little hints in there in those passages we read that it's a very joyous thing. I shall rejoice. You know, I, I shall be lifted up and so forth. I shall rejoice. I, I'll see this all as a blessing. You don't see it as a blessing when you're stuck down there and when you've got this other thought. And just to kind of connect the dots a little bit, um, I really think these are states that, that we go through. We, we go through states, I certainly go through states where the things that I'm thinking about myself are not, are not true. Or the things that I think about people I'm in, in relationships with are, are, are not true. And, I'm, and yet I'm stuck in that. I can't think another thought. The only thing I have in my thought is this person thinks I'm no good or whatever it is, you know? And for that time being, I'm fastened in that thought and I can't get out. And it takes some truth, some outside force, the Lord to come down. I honestly believe this is what a lot of the miracles, the, the raising of Lazarus and the Old Testament miracles of Elijah, you know, stretching out on the child and, 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 and lifting to life. Let's think some more about those dry bones mm, in the valley. I don't know if you can relate at all but think about a situation in which you used to have life. You used to have spiritual life. And things were, were going along. And then something, some falsity or some, you know, some, I don't know what, how it is for you. But sometimes a thought will just come in like a dagger into your head. You know, just like the whole thing has been a waste of time or something. You know, you get some knife coming into your mind like that. And it just slays you like, oh, God, it's so true. It's been a total waste. All that, F, you know, and you're just slain by the thought. And you lose all the flesh of your love. You, you, you lose the skin of your boundary. And you just descend to the point where these very, very dry bones, you know, out in this valley. Valley. A low place, right? The pit. He's dried, but there's nothing there but these bones. And what does the Lord say? Son of man, go and prophesy to the bones and bring them the word because it's the change of the thought. It's the truth that will lift them up. It's the blood of the covenant, which means the divine truth. That's the, that's the, that's the truth that one of the truths is that the Lord loves you. The Lord knows what you're going through, doesn't judge you or whatever. You know, all this has been for your protection. This is better than the alternative, believe it or not, kind of thing. So you think about those dry bones and just all scattered on that valley. I picture them in the sand, just scattered all over on that valley floor. And this depicts like an entire church, an entire religion. You know, it's just been wiped out by hell. I mean, they became vulnerable and hell just came in and just there was a slaughter. And there's still people who are alive. But like spiritually, you know, we've lost our hope. We don't see any hope anymore. They're just like bones in there. And, when, and, and Ezekiel goes out, surely thinking, himself possibly, this is a waste of time, but the Lord told me to do it. And he prophesies to the bones. And the bones, the first thing they do is they come together. See, what a bone is supposed to be, right? Isn't a bone, it serves many, many functions. But one of them is to give you structure and strength for the love, for the flesh that you have, and for your heart and everything. That's what they're supposed to supply. They're not just supposed to be by themselves. You're not supposed to have an arm bone over here and a knee bone way over there. You know, it's supposed to be organized and purposeful with, with love. So he prophesies, and there's no breath yet, but the bones start to get together. You start to see one truth and another truth that starts to come together, you know. And then you start to see the love, the flesh starts to come on it. And then the Spirit of the Lord has to come in, that, that the divine truth that animates the whole thing and brings the people to life and brings them into the Holy Land. That's what it said. They go into the land of Israel. And many of the body of the saints who had fallen asleep, isn't that the same people we're talking about? The graves were opened. This is, a, this is like a, a burial in a way. You know, there's a deadness down here. But the Lord is merciful. He knows there's hope for those bones. He knows they can come back. 
and the graves are opened. And the body of many of the saints that had fallen asleep went into the holy city and appeared to many. They came to life, you know? I don't know who saw that and who recorded that in Matthew, but I believe it's the truth because that's, that's not just some bizarre little side little ghostly little story, <laughs> and neither is Ezekiel 37. I think that's a big point of why the Lord came into the world was to save, not only preserve the salvation of the heavens and restore freedom in the world of spirits, but to release these captives, those who were bound. And it doesn't mean that we don't get bound at times in our lives. It doesn't mean that we won't be bound when we go into the other world for a while. People go down there. They go through what are called vastations, and they, they you know, get purified of these old ideas that they have or things that they're attached to and so on. And that can be intense and painful. And then when they're lifted up, Swedenborg says they're lifted up with tremendous joy. Turn to Isaiah, if you would, back in the Old Testament again, about in the middle of your book, chapter 44, verses 21 to 23. Remember these, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Oh, the lower parts of the earth. Shout. <laughs> Sing, you heavens. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. The Lord has redeemed Jacob. So Abraham, Gideon, all those people, they didn't get their promise at the time. But it was going to be all at once. Isn't that what it said? We together with them. Everybody rise up together after the Lord comes in the world. You know, in Isaiah 30, it says that the, at the time of the Lord's coming, the sun will shine sevenfold as brightly like the sun of seven days and the moon will shine like the sun. The Lord's power and glory increased greatly in this world and made things possible for people, was able to save people. So I believe there's a, there's a new church, there's a Swedenborgian way of thinking about this harrowing of hell, which is really a descent into the lower earth and the freeing, the release of the people who are there, the release of the captives. And at the time of the last judgment that Swedenborg records in 1757, he said there was again a similar type of release of those souls under the altar that, that uh, were spoken about in Revelation. Some people were Michael and his angels who could fight the dragon, but some were souls under the altar. They'd already been slain and uh, they, they didn't have the strength to fight. They would succumb if they had fought in that battle. So they're kept safe. And just like the once you've got all the warlords dealt with, with the help of those who are strong, then the weak, the children, can come forth and be saved. It's a beautiful thing to me to know that the Lord regards our, our weakness and knows, he just knows what we are capable of enduring and what we're not. And he's got a plan for us. And he can't explain everything to us all the time. So it would be very mysterious. Uh, but he does intend to set the captives free. And I believe that people rose up with great joy. Like those who wait for the morning. The morning finally dawned for them. And they rose up into the light. And were taken up to be in the Lord forever. It said in those passages it would be an everlasting salvation. Thank you, good friends. I hope it has not been a harrowing experience for you. Let's say the closing prayer. <laughs> Depending on what you mean by harrowing. <laughs> Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, thank you for your infinite wisdom and mercy to know who among us have the strength and who need to be protected. We thank you, Lord, for creating a place of protection, a state of protection. We ask that you lift us 
up and save us from the pit. Lift us up from the miry clay. Let us stand on the solid rock so that we may move forward. Lift us up in joy to be with you, Lord. And help us recognize when our friends and loved ones and others who need us are in that pit and strengthen us to speak the truth with love so that they may have a way to be released in your name. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done, as in heaven so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Keep on repenting, friends. The Lord wants to be one with you.